May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable unto thee, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. So there are daily services at the temple in which the Jewish priests make sacrifice for all the sins of the nation of Israel. Twice a day, they go in and they make a sacrifice. And the people are gathered in the courtyard where the altar is. And the designated priest would then go into the sanctuary to burn incense And the people would use this time to offer their own personal prayers. And we have these two men in the parable. The Pharisee and the tax collector. Offering their prayers during this this time in the service where that's appropriate. Now the Pharisee is standing by himself. That's important. He's standing by himself, so he's not, he doesn't want to be defiled by the common people around him. If they are ritually unclean and he touches them, then he is unclean as well. And he certainly wouldn't want that. But his prayer isn't really a prayer at all. It's a little sermon about how great he is compared with other people. He's not really interested in thanking God for the atonement being made. He's not really interested in asking God for help. He just wants to make sure that other people know how very pious he is. In other words, he's there for the same reason some of us come to church. Not to interact with God, but to make sure other people know how good we are. Now, the tax collector is also standing off by himself, but that's because he doesn't think he's worthy to be there with everyone else. And he beats his breast, which is only done in deep distress and mourning. Our translation has him asking for mercy, but the word that's used in the Greek is actually about making making atonement. So here he is at the normal atonement service, and he doesn't think that he could possibly be included in the atonement already being made for everyone else. He asks God specifically to make atonement for him, to save him from his sins, because he thinks that he needs extra grace to make up for the horrible deeds that he himself has done. Now, first things first, both of these men are sinners. Both of them stand in need of the grace of God. But one of them has decided that he is a good and decent person who is righteous all by himself. Thank you very much. And only the other one received the grace that he needed. Not because God's grace wasn't available to everyone, but because it must be received in a spirit of humility and honesty. There is good news here, and there is bad news. The bad news is that none of us are good enough to be justified before God. And that's that. Instead of listing other people's sins, the Pharisee should have listed his own. No matter how much good he does, he will still be a sinner. We all are. 
And so if you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. There is no way to dig yourself out of that hole. Now here's the good news. The good news is God is merciful. God does want to save us from our own miserable, sinful existence. And he does it. He has provided the perfect sacrifice in Jesus Christ so that we no longer have to hold the service of atonement every day, twice a day, like in the temple. In Christ, we can receive forgiveness for our sins. So he who humbles himself will be justified. He who humbles himself will even be exalted. There are two more lessons to be learned along these lines here. And we find them in our reading from the prophet Jeremiah. Or rather, we find them in the part of that passage that we didn't read. The part we've read sounds an awful lot like the tax collector from the parable. Though our iniquities testify against us, act, O Lord, for thy name's sake. We acknowledge our wickedness, O Lord, and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against thee. But elsewhere in the same passage, we read, Thus says the Lord concerning his people. They have loved to wander thus. They have not restrained their feet. Therefore the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. And in another place nearby is this. You have rejected me, says the Lord. You keep going backward. So I have stretched out my hand against you and destroyed you. I am weary of relenting. Obviously, this is not the same thing as we see with the tax collector in Jesus' parable. These people are saying all the right things, but they are still not right with God. Why? How can that be? Well, because their repentance is all show. There is no turning or attempt at turning. There is only desire and the attempt to fulfill that desire. The people are thirsty and hungry. They want rain. So they come to the only one who can give it to them. And they grovel. Now, there's nothing wrong with groveling. Groveling can often be the exactly correct action for us. But we're dealing with God here. And God can tell when your groveling isn't honest. He can tell when you don't really mean it. You can't manipulate God to get what you want. And it seems that is precisely what the Judeans are trying to do here. But there is also something more subtle in all of this. What about the righteous among the sinners? Like Jeremiah, for instance. What happens to them? Well, it seems that in this case, at least, they go through the same tribulation as everyone else. That doesn't mean that God has abandoned them. From Jesus' teaching, it would seem that they are justified and right with God. But that may not mean that they get everything they want. It won't mean that they don't have to experience the evil all around them. They will be saved from themselves, but they may not be saved from Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonians. But then, to those of us who know Jesus, none of that ultimately matters. Our perspective is always eternal rather than temporal. St. Paul writes to St. Timothy, I am already at the point of being sacrificed. The time of my departure has come. And even at that juncture, he isn't looking so much at what is going to happen in the next few days and weeks as he is to what is going to happen after that. He says, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, 
which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And then St. Paul tells the story of his legal proceedings. He had to defend himself in court. His life was on the line. Everyone deserted him, but he prays that they may be forgiven for that. And then he says, but the Lord stood by me and gave me strength to proclaim the message fully that all the Gentiles might hear it. What message? Well, instead of giving a defense of himself, he took the public appearance in court as an opportunity to proclaim the good news that God has saved us from our sins in the life and work of this Jesus from Nazareth. Now that is an eternal perspective. Paul is focused on the task. He's going to make sure that all the Gentiles hear the message of God's mercy and forgiveness. Because, as he says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil and save me for his heavenly kingdom. And he believes that even when he is already on the point of being sacrificed. You see, we can always continue to take the attitude of the Pharisee in the parable. We can keep on coming to church on Sunday, thinking that it's so good of us to come, that that's somehow an achievement. thinking how wonderful it is that we are not like all those sinners out there who don't come and wondering why they don't. But of course, then we would go back to our houses unjustified, without a relationship to Jesus, without being saved from our sins. The only alternative is to take the path of the tax collector in the parable which is the same path as St. Paul's. We begin by acknowledging our sin and the righteousness of God. We continue by turning from the one and toward the other. And we further continue by telling others about this good news of life in Jesus. But we conclude We conclude by pouring out our entire lives as a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the one who had mercy on us. That is fighting the good fight, finishing the race, and keeping the faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.